Let me just introduce our first speaker. Dave um, is a research software engineer at Newcastle University who has recently made the switch into academia from industry. And he's going to share his experience from the FinTrust project um, that is researching technical, social, and ethical approaches to establishing published public trust in new financial technologies. So I'll just hand over to Dave. Let me just uh, start with this video. Over to you, Dave. Thank you. I'll just share my screen. So thanks very much uh, to the source organizers for inviting me to speak today and uh, welcome. My name is Dave Horsfall and I'm a research software engineer at Newcastle University in the UK. I started work at Newcastle seven months ago and I was recruited for two really exciting projects, one of which is the Fintrust project that I'll be speaking about today. So Fintrust is a three year project led by Newcastle University and supported by Atom Bank based in the northeast of England. It's funded by UK Research and Innovation and brings together researchers from various disciplines, including the Business School and the School of Computing. Primarily, the project explores the role of machine learning in banking, particularly in the context of automated decision making and whether this can lead to bias and financial exclusion. Fintech or financial technology is the technology and innovation that aims to compete with traditional methods in the delivery of financial services and typically refers to the space where technology coordinates and performs financial processes. Fintech has seen a revolution over the last decade and unlike the banking IT phase, which was process oriented, Fintech is a fundamentally novel phenomenon uh, enabled by internet access and is customer centric. So as more of us choose to use mobile banking and interact using bots driven by artificial intelligence, we need to know how to create relationships based on trust between companies and customers. In this context, trust is a willingness of the customer to abandon control over the actions performed by the chatbot and rely on the automation behaving as they expect. There's been a sizable increase in recent years in the effort to build emotionally intelligent bots that communicate like humans. However, trust research in this financial field is still lacking. So the FinTrust team has performed research to categorize the top traits expected from a financial chatbot to be able to trust it. And this presentation explores how I, as an RSE, have approached the development of a chatbot prototype that engineers these trust traits into a conversational interface uh, to facilitate research in this area. So I've aimed the discussion at quite a high level, exploring concepts of trust uh, research in a social science context and how this is bridged through technology to software engineering. We'll start with a definition of a chatbot and explain some of the use cases the team are considering and I'll briefly highlight some social science theories on trust and explain what our research has found about trust in chatbots. Um, we'll then move on to a typical system architecture and look at the basics of Google Dialogflow and discuss the mechanisms for building trust, including small talk and real time emotional analysis. Um, but before I get started, I just wanted to briefly touch on my recent entry into the RSE profession. My academic background is in physics, and although I did have a short academic career, I basically couldn't wait to get out and have on the whole enjoyed working in industry over the last 14 years. Um, it was only last year that I became a little disillusioned with the private sector and applied for this RSE position uh, based on a very engaging job description, but without any real awareness of the wider RSE space or, move, or movement. Um, I'm absolutely thrilled by this leap of faith because for me, the RSE role ticks so many boxes for me personally, and uh, I'm excited to be part of the community. Another motivating factor for me was the idea of working in the absolutely stunning brand new Catalyst building shown here at Newcastle University. 
the RC team actually moved into this building on the day of my interview, but unfortunately I started work on the 30th of March, which was just a few days after the government imposed severe lockdown restrictions, meaning that I still haven't worked in this building or met the majority of the people that I work with on a day-to-day -day basis. This uh, puts me in a unique position and I've tried to throw a lot of energy into the role as any new starter would, but have faced severely challenging circumstances, uh, as have we all. I'm a really big advocate of well-being and mental health in the workplace and um, it's important to recognise that there's nothing normal about our new normal. I've started a series of blog posts about mental health and academia specifically focused on software engineering and I've also um, started contributing to the development of mental health guides for early career researchers in STEM and that's in conjunction with two UK based charities called Jonathan's Voice and the Charlie Waller Memorial Trust. I think this is something that will become increasingly important to talk about over the coming months. And if anyone has any interest or would like to talk more, please don't hes hesitate to reach out to me after the presentation. And if anyone would like more information about anything in the talk, including papers, research, or tech services, uh, my contact details will be on the last slide. Uh, so back to chatbots and a definition. What is it that we're talking about? Uh, a chatbot is an artificial intelligence application that can imitate a real conversation with a human in their natural language. So in the banking sector, conversational interfaces are embedded in a, a number of services, and I thought it'd be useful to describe some of the use cases to give a little context to the rest of the talk. Um, the first and most commonly encountered is the banking support chatbots. This bot provides support for standard banking services such as checking your balance, paying bills or transferring money. The second example is a personal assistant. These assistants might provide motivation and coaching for saving money or help you understand how much you're spending in particular areas so that you can make changes to your behavior. And the final use case is a robo advisor. These are platforms that provide automated algorithm driven financial planning services and can automatically invest assets based on future goals. So these are some of the types of chatbots that the FinTrust team are considering in this trust research. Automation raises issues about privacy, such as data breaches, mishandling and misuse of personal data, uh, the inability to regulate what the system monitors and not knowing its intentions for doing so, and being uninformed about the actual workings of the algorithm process. It's important to understand trust from a user standpoint in order to create better automated designs. Trust is a central factor for developing effective human technology exchanges because a system may be technologically well designed and highly functional, but if untrusted, will remain unused. And alternatively, individuals may unjustifiably trust and disclose information to unreliable systems. In 2000, NAS and Moon published the CASA framework, short for computers are social actors. It states that humans mindlessly apply the same social heuristics used for human interactions to computers because they call to mind similar social attributes as humans. So basically people apply social rules and expectations to computers, even though they know that these machines don't have feelings or intentions or human motivations. Machines exhibit forms of intelligence and behavior that are different from human behavior and so our aim is to lower tensions in this human to machine interaction. And one way to decrease tension and increase trust in users is to infuse chatbots with socio-emotional features such as politeness and empathy. We've seen a significant increase in literature over recent years in the effort to build emotionally intelligent bots that communicate like humans. Many of these bots mimic human social rules and norms and this movement is grounded in social science and effective computing theories such as CASA that help us understand why these features increase trust and sustain conversation. The socio-emotional features promote coherence in the human to machine interaction, decrease tensions, increase human inter user interactivity and target behavior such as sustained usage and increased trust. 
So following studies earlier in 2020, the research from the FinTrust team has identified the following traits as important for establishing trust in financial chatbots. Um, primarily and as expected, participants requested the chatbot be built with low privacy risks and security concerns and valued privacy friendly chatbots that securely and uh, safely encrypt data. In order to trust it, participants also required a high level of comprehension and accuracy in response to their messages, where the bot can accurately understand what they type with limited opportunities for misunderstandings. A high number of participants expressed that a bot that has an approachable conversational style and is creative in its conversation is trustworthy. They wanted it to ask questions back using coherent and concise language that is easy to understand and they wanted a bot that replies in a similar way to a human conversation and objected to clearly automated stock uh, messages and repetitive stock phrases. They specified that the bot should exercise tailored responses and non-generic answers fluidly using a variety of different phrases and for its answers to make coherent grammatical sense. Uh, to in increase trust, the underlying chatbot functionalities were also an important feature these include the ability for the chatbot to monitor user account activity, reporting any unusual experiences. For example, dispatching notifications of unusual transactions or giving users a warning if an overseas account transaction was taking place. We also found that participants valued having ultimate control of the automation in the financial process. A high number of participants repeated that the chatbot should have a pause or override button to ensure that the chatbot does not make any financial decisions without explicit consent. And this element of control has been linked to trust in literature where the need for controlling a behavior or action decreases as trust increases. So as trust is gained throughout a conversation, the individual is more willing to take risks and ease these monitoring behaviors. And the last trait is politeness. Uh, the and options for personalization. This uh, is where the bot uses polite language, adheres to conversational turn taking, makes small talk and greets participants with their preferred name and individual feedback. And participants also specified that the bot deliver appropriate messages responding to their emotions and uh, acknowledging them. So in order to discuss how to engineer these trust traits into a chatbot application, we should first consider a typical architecture for a bot service. On the left here, we have our end user who is engaging with the system through a presentation layer. The presentation layer um, may consist of a chat client embedded in a web application in a browser, or it could be embedded directly into a mobile application. The user will send messages directly into the centralized bot service and the role of this service is to mediate communication with the, all the different parts of the system. The first part of the workflow when a user expression is received is to send it to the machine learning layer. Natural language processing is used to interpret the intent, the intent of what the user is asking. So we turn the raw user input into some kind of structured data that we can use in some kind of decision-making algorithm in formulating the response back to the user. Once a decision has been made about how we're gonna respond, it's very likely that we'll need to engage with some kind of data layer. This could be a customer database um, internally within the stack, or it could be some external data uh, API sitting outside the stack. But once we've interpret interpreted the intent of the user, decided how we're going to respond and obtain all the data that we need. We'll push it back through some natural language generation, generation process back to the centralized bot service that pushes it back to the presentation layer for the end user to see. In order to quickly build a working chatbot prototype to research trust in this area, I've used Google Dialogflow as the machine learning layer of our technology stack. Dialogflow is a natural language understanding platform that can be used to design and integrate conversational interfaces into chatbots. It allowed me very quickly to leverage the significant machine learning capabilities of Google so that we could focus on designing 
and implementing the trust traits. A dialogue flow agent is a virtual agent that handles conversations with the end user. It's a natural language understanding module that is trained to handle expected conversation scenarios. And intent is uh, categorizes the end user's intention for one conversation term, and each agent will have many defined intents where the combined intents can handle a complete conversation. When the user writes something, dialogue flow matches the expression to the best intent in the agent. For example, we might ask our agent, how much did I spend on travel in January or can I see my latest withdrawals? A basic intent contains firstly the training phrases and these are example phrases for what the end user might say. When an end user expression resembles one of these phrases, dialogue flow matches the intent. When an intent is matched at runtime, dialogue flow provides the extracted values from the user expression as parameters. Each defined parameter has a type called the entity type, which dictates exactly how the data is extracted. And unlike raw user inputs, parameters are structured data that can easily be used to perform some logic or generate responses. When an intent is matched, but dialogue flow is unable to extract all of the required parameters, dialogue flow will initiate conversation with the user and ask questions to request the missing parameters until they are all collected. And we'll see later how this fulfills many of our required trust traits by demonstrating comprehension, polite turn taking and providing enhanced levels of control. So in the example shown here, we see all of our user questions are matched to the account spending check intent and our defined parameters of date time, category and merchant can be extracted from the user expressions. And those structured parameters allow us to build an appropriate response to the user. As you would expect, Dialogflow has client libraries for popular languages that allow us to easily integrate with our agents using the REST API. In this snippet, we see the extent of the code required to query the Dialogflow API. And you'll see that the response provides both the matched intent with a confidence score and also the generated fulfillment text in response to the user's input. This offers us good flexibility because we can rely directly on the response from Dialogflow or we can alternatively intercept, intercept the workflow internally within our local stack based on the matched intent and other factors to manipulate the response. And you'll see how this is leveraged in a moment during emotional analysis. The level of comprehension of the agent correlates with the range and the quality of the intent configuration. And this is also true for the level of functionality that's delivered by the agent to the user. When a user engages the chatbot to perform some kind of financial service where some action is going to be performed, it's likely that the bot will need to engage in further conversation to extract additional parameters. For example, if the user wants to transfer some money, it's unlikely that the user would provide everything required to complete the action in the first request. The bot will need to ask uh, from which account do you want to transfer, where do you want to move it to, or how much money do you want to move? Uh, once all of the required parameters are known, this is where a, de a decision is made about the level of control for the user. To maximize control, the bot would repeat the entire action back to the user and wait for an explicit confirmation, such as, okay, I'm about to move 300 pounds from your savings account to your current account, is that correct? The entire process demonstrates a high level of comprehension and transparency to the user, but also leaves them feeling in control all of which meets our design specification. Additionally, one mechanism for us to measure if trust is gained during a conversation is to keep asking questions such as, would you like me to automate that next time after actions are completed? And if the user is willing to relax the monitoring behavior, we know that this indicates increased trust. By including the ability to engage in small talks, in, in small talk, um, our chatbot can provide responses to casual conversation. It allows the agent to answer common questions outside the scope of the defined intents. The small talk feature directly meets one of our required trust traits and dialogue flow supports this through a system of around 90 built in small talk intents. These target 
user expressions asking about the agent or the user giving information about themselves. They also span specific categories such as greetings where we can define how the bot should say hello or goodbye in various common scenarios and courtesy where politeness can be defined and emotions where you can define responses if the system determines the user is amused or surprised, for example. Um, so, for example, if the user asks, who are you, this is identified as small talk um, and through the configuration of our agent, we can specify multiple response variations that will be used when this action is triggered. Um, another example would be, how old are you or you're annoying? And by building up response variations, we reduce the use of stock phrases being returned to the user and it's possible to infuse a specific personality type into the chatbot. This is true not just for the small talk responses, but also the responses um, to the main functional intents relating to banking activity. The science of configuring personality through linguistic responses falls to the social scientists in the team, but by engineering the feature into the software, we make it possible for users to engage in small talk, reduce the use of stock phrases and offer creative responses that present an approachable personality uh, which are all features that have been established to build trust. We see here an API response returned to the presentation layer that is identifying the user's query as small talk and fulfilling the request with one of our defined responses. I've personally had a lot of fun with the small talk feature and it's interesting to note that if a user asks who are you or where do you live, the response should always identify the agent as a machine and not a real human being. IBM have led the development of a code of ethics for AI and chatbots, which discuss and provide guidance for ethical development. Building trust may involve imitating specific types of human behavior, but this should be done transparently. Customers always need to know when they're communicating with a machine and not an actual human being. Despite the above, there will be situations where the chatbot is unable to comprehend what is being asked either because the agent is not sufficiently configured with the intents the user expects or something else has gone wrong. Um, in order to meet the trust design requirements, we need to be able to acknowledge and respond appropriately to user emotions. Part of this is covered with small talk. However, we can implement machine learning for emotion detection and uh, perform emotional analysis in real time uh, to regulate the chatbot responses. By understanding if the end user is, for example, angry or sad or happy or confident, we can adapt both our conversational style and algorithmic decision making to address concerns before proceeding with the conversation. So far in our prototype, we're focused on the emotion of anger to catch frustration from the user. <clears throat> if we understand the user is angry, we can ask the user if we're getting things wrong and linguistically show increased empathy in our responses. Once again, to quickly leverage emotional analysis, <clears throat> we've integrated with an established API in the IBM cloud called Watson Tone Analyzer. As shown in the API response here, we can see that for each request, the submitted text is assessed against various emotional tones, which are assigned a score between zero and one. Qualifying tones with scores of greater than 0.5 are returned in the API response and can be used to analyze the emotion of what the user has just written. <clears throat> Although IBM have released some details about the underlying science behind the service, it is important to recognize that there is no unit associated with the score and no margin of error is provided. For those of you who caught the excellent source presentation last month by Stephen Anning, who spoke about the development of an NLP pipeline for a conflict narrative detection, we know it is easy to provide examples where the Watson service fails to identify emotion within a wider cultural context or behaves unexpectedly, for example, by incorrectly assessing sarcasm. It's important to accept these limitations um, when analyzing emotion within the chatbot system and reflect those constraints within the automated design. We don't use the results from Watson to assume absolute emotion from the user, 
if the emotional analysis indicates anger, then we engage with the user uh, to ask a question such as, oh no, did I get that wrong? I'm sorry if I'm not understanding you well, and allow them to clarify their emotional, emotional state. The response can then be used to build a new dialogue strategy to adjust the conversation accordingly. And this approach helps us meet our requirement of delivering appropriate messages and responding to user emotion, which is known to establish trust. So finally, I'd like to touch very briefly on the GUI considerations. I'm running a bit tight on time, so I'll just push through this, this slide. Um, the effort in the prototype so far has been focused on the CUI or conversational user interface. Um, but there are a number of interesting ideas that could be researched in the GUI, such as the inclusion of human-like avatars and emotional mimicry. Uh, but in truth, these are future design considerations and the main trust trait targeted in the GUI design now is security and privacy. The objective here is not to necessarily create a secure or privacy preserving chatbot. We are seeking to understand how to build trust. Um, build trust in the context of understanding that uh, privacy and security are important in doing so. Visual cues and reminders about security features are important and transparency about uh, what data is being collected, how it's stored and what happens to the conversation transcript after the chat ends all need to be embedded into the design. Um, so thanks for listening. I hope I've been able to give a little taste of some of the concepts and challenges I've faced in this project. The FinTrust team is excited about the ongoing chatbot study and the opportunity the opportunities raised by the working prototype. I think it's a great example of the value that an RSE can bring into a multidisciplinary project and on a personal level, um, really thinking about the practical impact of human computer interaction and effective computing theories on system design will undoubtedly make me a better RSE in future projects. So thanks very much and I'm happy to try and answer any questions. Okay, many thanks, Dave. Um, fascinating talk. Um, really enjoyed it. So let's see if there are any uh, questions. So I have a question, if I may. Please go ahead. Hi, Dave. Um, thank you for the excellent presentation. Uh, it was very nice um, to, to hear uh, what you're doing. I have a question. So in one of your um, slides, you showed uh, the user interface uh, for, for talking between a human and, and the chatbot is similar to what humans usually use to chat among themselves. So it's like a chat window that you type your text and then you get a reply. Um, do you think there should be some, some distinct marker which uh, tells the human that, that you are not talking to a human but to a machine so that they can uh, constrain what, what they are saying? Uh, for example, uh, sarcasm is an example. Machines who don't always understand that. So do you think you should put a, some sort of visual cue there saying that you're talking to a machine, not a human? Uh, yeah, I think it's really important to um, try and embed that very clearly into the, into the design and also linguistically at the start of the conversation. So when you greet each other, uh, which is inevitable, like hello, um, uh, and to actually explicitly state in that initial um, communication between the, the two, um, entities that, hi, I'm a virtual assistant, um, is important. Whether or not um, you would give guidance about how to communicate is an interesting point. Um, it's, it's possibly better, um, it's, it's interesting. Um, I think the, the CASA framework tells us that regardless of, even if you give advice about how to interact uh, with a chatbot, humans are always going to interact with it like it's a human. Um, so we just need to do our best to try and catch sarcasm. Um, and that's down to not always assuming, um, for example, if you're doing emotional analysis, uh, to, to assume that you've, you've understood that correctly and just to, just to gauge that with the, within the conversation. Thank you.